today where we're going to talk about uh, Hashimoto's. So Hashimoto's is, uh, well, it's, it's a it's a big, big deal because um, there's so many people being affected by it. And, um, and it, it's actually destroying lives and uh, conventional medicine is missing some of the pieces. So today, what I really want to do is I want to be able to, um, to elaborate a little bit on Hashimoto's today as much as I can. Um, this presentation today is designed to be more so, um, more so about, uh, more so for for people that are that are already somewhat versed in Hashimoto's, if that if that makes sense, uh, somebody who either either knows that um, that they have a, a diagnosis of Hashimoto's, or or think they have a diagnosis of Hashimoto's, that's really what it is. So this 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 uh, presentation today is is to be is designed to be a little bit more advanced than just thyroid issues. Um, so that that's what it is because I'm. When I'm teaching, and I'm always teaching, I have a hard time to uh, decide or determine the, the 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 audience's level of knowledge about the topic I'm discussing. And if I'm talking a little bit too adv- uh, talking about something a little bit more advanced than what people can grasp, then you know they lose engagement. And and if I'm talking about things that aren't av- advanced enough, well, then I can lose engagement as well. So when, when we were sending out a link on this topic, and I, I literally just finished this presentation today, so I admit to that, um, I, I was really trying to navigate through it, that navigate through it in a way that, that it would be stimulating enough for the people who are already familiar with Hashimoto's. So, so that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, I think I find it's really important to, for people to know who's speaking to them today um, about what we're talking about. So I'll give you a little bit of my background and then we'll, we'll jump right into it. So my clinic, in my clinic, we practice something called functional medicine, functional diagnostic medicine that it's, it's also been coined that my doctorate is in chiropractic. I don't really practice chiropractic anymore. Only maybe a couple appointments a week, if that Um, everything that we work with is dealing with chronic and autoimmune conditions. That that is the world I live in, and that's the world I love, and that's the world we thrive in. And functional medicine has a unique position, or functional integrative medicine has a unique position to work with disorders like um, like Hashimoto's. And uh, and hopefully in this presentation, I can give you some tools. You have some tools that you can kind of sink your teeth into to understand something as complex as Hashimoto's and hopefully make it uh, understandable because, you know, I'm speaking you to you here today. I'm very passionate about this topic because I have also, I have a diagnosis of Hashimoto's um, myself. So, so that's my background, uh, chiropractic, that's my doctorate and my postgraduate certifications are in multiple fields of functional medicine. Okay. Um, I'll get in a little bit more what functional medicine is. Um, I've learned over the years when I've, I've, I've spoken around the country, I've spoken around the state. Um, I've learned over the years that when I'm listening to someone present, it, it's not only important to know, you know, what their background is and, you know, where, what is their reference point on the, on the topic of discussion, but also, um, also, you know, why do they do what they do? Um, and, and if you talk to most people in healthcare, a, both line, both sides of the of the healthcare aisle, medical and and non medical. Um, most people have a story, and I do as well. And I'm, I want to keep it simple, but it's important. I think that anybody who's listening to this knows where I'm coming from. You know, it all started when I was in school. This is a a few years back, <laughs> quite a few years back, <laughs> and uh, it was in this picture when I found out I was a pre diabetic. Now I was studying in school. I was going through a lot of like any academic program, a lot of uh, emotional stress and, and uh, sleep deprivation and financial stress and everything, every stress imagined. But it, but it, and when I went into school, I was an athlete and literally in, in, in well, it was just a few months, I, I found out I was a pre diabetic. Now I wasn't sleeping, I was sleeping three to five hours a night. I was studying 12 to 16 hours a day of solid study. Um, definitely my diet wasn't optimal. Yeah, I was I was kind of in an urgent state to say the least, and everything in my world started to fall apart a little bit more and more. And, and you know, I thought I could put it off, and uh, I did. I did for a year, and then when in school we were testing ourselves and learning about blood chemistry, 
and the second year, um, it was in this picture and you can already see some inflammation in my face here. I was already a full blown type two diabetic in that picture. Okay. Um, my world was much worse than in the first picture. I didn't see it immediately, but everything in, in my life, my academic, uh, world was going down. My relationship was falling apart. Um, everything that was important to me, I was, I was, I was losing and, um, I was studying chiropractic and I was doing an internship with this doctor in Minneapolis. And he, um, he saw there were some problems that I had. I couldn't concentrate brain fog, everything. And he, he literally forced me. <laughs> he said, if you want to work in my clinic, um, you were going to have to, we're going to have to work on your health. And I didn't understand where that came from, but he was able to see something that I didn't see. And he helped me out and it took time. It took, it took months and months and months and months, uh, years. Um, but I'm not a diabetic or a pre-diabetic anymore. And, um, and I'm very fortunate if it wasn't for his help, um, I wouldn't be where I am today. There's no way I could do what I'm doing today. And I probably wouldn't have the appreciation that I do, uh, today for chronic illnesses. Um, it's also diabetes. Um, that shock to my body is probably also in my thoughts, what turned on Hashimoto's in my, in myself, I'll get more about that into triggers, but this is, this is, um, this is my background and who I am, and this is why I do what I do. So anyway, so that's um, a little bit about me, um, to touch a little bit on functional medicine. Now, functional medicine is not a new kind of medicine. It's a blend of, I always like to say it's a blend of the new with the old, but it's really a blend of really advanced diagnostic testing with natural medicine. And, um, and we live in a world where we have all these common disorders, these common diseases, they're real. They're all, you know, they, they, they are real, but they don't say anything about the mechanism of the disorder. And it's everything that's behind the scenes or, or uh, in the, in this picture, everything from inflammatory disorders to immune system dysfunctions to chemical exposure and, and so on and so forth. It's everything below the scenes or the underlying causes which are contributing to these disorders and Hashimoto's is no different. So functional medicine focus also focuses on these underlying issues. Okay, so that's, and, and again, it's a blend of advanced uh, diagnostic medicine. You'll learn about diagnostics today as well as natural solutions and, um, and functional medicine or di uh, non-pharmaceutical medicine doesn't have all the answers. Uh, I'll be the first person to tell you that, uh, yeah, the blend of, of non-medical non-pharmaceutical with functional medicine tends to be the best. If you use both sides of the aisle, you shouldn't have to choose. Um, so I wanted to, you know, when I was building this presentation, oh my goodness, um, it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And if you've ever watched any of my content, you'll see that I, it's very thorough. It's very thorough. I have to be careful to put it in a, in a way that people can, uh, you know, I don't, I don't lose people or, uh, or throw too much at them. But so I put together a little bit of an, an, an agenda. So first off, we'll start, we'll start with, um, you know, why thyroid health is so essential. So, um, the thyroid is really uh, a master gland. Yeah, the thyroid is, it's a master center. It's, it turns everything on or can turn everything off. And the, the thyroid is a thyroid hormone is one of the hormones that are probably the most, it is one of the most influential hormones in the body, body because there's thyroid receptors everywhere. Everything is affected by thyroid in one way or another. So it's one thing that if there's a problem with it, it can have systemic effects around the body. So it needs to be optimized. And that's what we're going to talk about here today. Um, some common symptoms of thyroid, you know, you, you, they're vast, they're really, really vast, but, but something to know about some thyroid symptoms is, is it can be split up into three categories. Hypothyroid symptoms are anything where there's low thyroid function, absolutely anything. So it could be slow gastric motility, like constipation is a common one, infertility, weight gain, outer one third of eyebrows thinning, hair thinning in general, low libido, anxiety, depression, lots of things with hypo. And hypo uh, thyroid disorders make up about 90, 95% of all thyroid disorders. It's the vast majority of thyroid dysfunction that we'll see in my office. Hyperthyroidism, on the other hand, is about that 5%. And it's where everything speeds up. There's too much thyroid hormone. This is more the opposites of the, everything opposite of hypo. Um, instead of slow and lethargic, you'd be fast and jittery. 
and anxious and, and sweating and coarse hair growth and uh, um, anxiety. I said that, that that's common with, with hyper um, yeah, more diarrhea type symptoms where, you know, if someone has a thyroid issue, hyperthyroidism, if it's not diagnosed and they have diarrhea all the time, they end up with nutrient deficiencies because they're not absorbing their nutrients. And, and if it's not looked at and ruled out, they have digestive issues until their, their body falls apart. Hyperthyroidism is much more serious than hypo, but both of these can compromise your life. They can literally be deadly because nothing works in the body if you don't have thyroid input. And then there's another world, I've done a video on this actually, where you can have both hypo and hyperthyroidism to make things complicated, but it's real, it's truly real. You can have both symptoms. This is something um, that is that that's really is uncontrolled Hashimoto's. We'll get more into. So anyway, uh, thyroid symptoms are very vast. It's a lot more than hair thinning and weight gain, if that makes sense, and fatigue, much, much more than that. Um, now, a basic understanding of thyroid function, uh, it's important to know the basics before we move on to the advanced. So I'm not going to have too much time with the basics, but I'm going to give you a little bit of an understanding of it if you, if, you, if you weren't aware of it already. Okay. So all things exciting in the body starts in the brain. Now, the brain is the, it's even a bigger master center than the, than the thyroid. The brain sends a signal in the form of a hormone called TSH. If you've been looking at labs and learning about this stuff, you've seen TSH tested, thyroid stimulating hormone. This is not a thyroid hormone. It's a brain hormone. So, um, so the thyroid is getting all the credit for this hormone, but it's not. It's a, it's a brain hormone coming from the brain, and this stimulates the thyroid. Okay, so the brain stimulates the thyroid. The thyroid can't do anything without brain input. The thyroid is going to produce two major hormones. One is T3. This is approximately only 7% of the thyroid output. The other is T4. This is 93% of what the thyroid makes. The problem with this 93% is you can't use this T4. This T4 is, I don't want to say it's useless, but it's almost useless. It needs to be converted into T3. So T3 is the golden hormone. It's the one we want. It's the one that does all the magic. All right. So T4, we need to convert this T4 into T3. T4 will get converted to the liver. And then in the liver, it'll go to T3. And then T4 also is converted in the gut. And that converts into T3. So the gut and the liver are responsible for mm, ballpark of, you know, 93. The research changes a little bit, but it's only a few percentages out. 93, 95% of, um, of all of your thyroid function is due to your liver and your gut. So if you have a liver problem, toxicity, processed foods, smoking, recreational, uh, hormonal disorders are connected to the liver. If you have any of those issues, you're going to have a thyroid problem. Um, if you have any gut issues, GI issues um, of any kind, celiac Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, random uh, sporadic bowel movements, you're going to have a thyroid issue. So two major organ systems that needed for thyroid function. So, so that's kind of the production of thyroid, but when T3 and T4 get low, so if you get into a low thyroid state, this sends a signal to the brain. So low thyroid hormones, when your, when your hormones get low, your brain gets signaled. When they get signaled, the brain ends up stimulating TSH and then TSH stimulates the thyroid, and then your thyroid stimulates T3 and T4. Okay. So, so that, so that's a, it's a, it's kind of a, it's a cycle. The, when low hormone comes into place, the brain gets stimulated. And then there's a, there's a series of events going back down to, to, to reproduce more hormones. So there's a feedback. So there's two rules to this. So rule one, when T3 and T4 decrease, TSH increases. Okay. Like we said, that's the feedback mechanism. And when TSH increases, um, this is a diagnosis of hypothyroidism. So if you have low T or high TSH, you'll have a diagnosis of hypothyroidism. Now the opposite is true. The second rule, when T3 and T4 increase, so when you have too much hormone in the body, well, this gives a mechanism to the brain. The brain reduces the stimulation to the thyroid. So it lowers TSH. 
so that these numbers can come back to normal. So the brain regulates the stimulation to the thyroid and increases thyroid stimulation if there's low T3 and T4 and reduces thyroid stimulation if there's high T3 and T4. So the, it's, it's, it's automatic and that's how it's supposed to work. So this is normal, okay? If you have high TSH, you're gonna get a diagnosis of low thyroid. If it's low TSH, you're gonna get a diagnosis of high thyroid. Okay, so that's the basics, okay? So um, now Hashimoto's thyroiditis, what is it? Well, Hashimoto's is an autoimmune disorder specific to the thyroid gland. It's a fancy word. It's a fancy name for, for autoimmune hypothyroidism. That, that is our autoimmune thyroid disease. Let's not jump into hypo yet. Autoimmune thyroid disease. That's what it is. Um, and this is an, an autoimmune disorders are an immune problem. Autoimmunity, we're going to talk about autoimmunity today. It's where the immune system confuses self from non-self, starts attacking yourself. And in, in Hashimoto's, your immune system is attacking your thyroid. Your immune system got confused. So it's an autoimmunity is an immune problem. Hashimoto's is an immune disorder that that and not a thyroid disorder. So I want you to wrap your head around that for a little bit. Hashimoto's is not a thyroid disorder. It results in a thyroid disorder. And if it goes on long enough, it'll result in hypothyroidism, low thyroid function. So you can only injure your thyroid so much till the, you know, till, till it can't produce. And then your hormones get low, TSH goes up and you're given a diagnosis. So that is Hashimoto's in a nutshell. And autoimmunity, the dark side of autoimmunity, another dark side of autoimmunity. Autoimmunity cannot be cured. Hashimoto's cannot be cured. You read books on how to, how to or, or watch videos on how to reverse your Hashimoto's. No, that's a lie. You can manage it, but you cannot cure it. Autoimmune disorders cannot be cured for the simple fact is your immune system is too intelligent. Your immune system does not forget when you get exposed to a virus or a bacteria. You will always have antibodies to fight that virus or bacteria. You will, your immune system will never forget a bacteria exposure that you had when you were two years old, ever. It keeps those antibodies in a filing cabinet in the back room and pulls them out when they need to. And chances are that bacteria doesn't even create a symptom to you. You knock it out, that infection. It doesn't forget in those situations and it doesn't forget once it targets your tissue. That's the dark side of it, but you can manage it. But it's very important people know the facts of autoimmunity so they don't progress the damage and, and have things that they can do with Hashimoto's like myself. Okay. Um, so how prevalent is Hashimoto's? Hmm, there's a lot of it out there. More than 20 million Americans are suffering from thyroid disorders. Okay. More than, more than 20, 20 million Americans. Um, I'm going to, uh, there's some questions coming in. My apologies. I'm by myself. I can't answer all of them, but um, hopefully at the end I can, or you can send me emails and things like that. Otherwise I'll end up pausing, but I'll, get to all these questions. And if I don't, please, please email me. I'll give you all my contact information at the end. So 20 million Americans suffering from thyroid disorders. Um, that's just thyroid. That's hypo and hyper. Um, autoimmunity, autoimmune disorders account for approximately 90% of all adult hypothyroidism, 90%. Okay. So um, if you have hypothyroidism, you should know the cause of it. Not everybody with hypothyroidism has Hashimoto's. I'll get more into this. The majority of Hashimoto's um, patients are women. Women are highest risk of autoimmunity because autoimmunity loves estrogen. Women have more estrogen, so they're a higher target for autoimmunity. We're learning more about this as we go, but this is what we know so far. Between 20 and 60 years old, and nearly 10% show overt hypothyroidism. Overt means um, obvious, <laughs> obvious hypothyroidism, the symptoms of it. Um, Overall incidence is about one per uh, per thousand people per year. Okay, Hashimoto's disease is the most common autoimmune endocrine disorder in the world. It's the most common, so um, it's something we have to know about. You know, and it wasn't. I think it was last year, the year before. I was looking back through my records at the end of the year. You know, what kind of cases that we see? Ninety percent of our clients. Ninety percent. I couldn't believe it when I look back in the records. Ninety percent of our clients. Were, were, came to us for thyroid disorders, 90%. So we see a lot of it, right? And there's a lot of it out there. And it's important because people can have abstract symptoms 
and stubborn symptoms of weight and lethar energy and all this and thyroid could have been missed. And I'm going to share with you today on how things get missed. So you don't miss them and you can, you know, you can figure it out. So that is, um, what is Hashimoto's? Um, how to diagnose Hashimoto's now here is maybe the question that, that I just came in. Diagnosing is where everything is. You've got to know how to diagnose this. And I can't run blood on you through Zoom, but I can give you the tools that you can pursue it or you can reach out to us and we can help you. Testing is knowing. If you don't test, you don't know. And a big part of the way our clients get the results they do is because we don't guess. We have the science, so we want to use it. Uh, the science isn't being used in all, all parts of, of medicine, if you will. It just isn't. So I'll talk more about that. So here's an example of testing uh, and the problems with testing. Thyroid stimulating hormone. If you're watching this, you probably know what this is now. Um, the, there's a problem with ranges. And I'd like to talk about these ranges quite a bit because they're important. So traditional lab ranges are not based off like what, what the reference range of what's normal um, are not based off science. <laughs> They're based off statistical averages. They're based off statistics. They're not based off health. Um, and the ranges vary. The 0.3 to 5.7, it does change depending on the state, county, and country you're in because it's based off statistical averages. 90% of the population has to fit in this, tradi in this traditional lab range. And if they don't, if, if they don't get 90% of the population, they move the goalpost to fit 90% in. And, and they're with the understanding that 90% of the population is healthy. Well, you know, maybe 80 years ago, that was accurate, but it sure isn't in, in, in North America nowadays. So we've skewed these ranges to fit 90% of the population in, and it's based off statistical averages, and we don't have blood off on everybody. So the people going to do blood work usually have a health problem. So now we are focused on 90% of the sickest population of the country. We got to be careful with this, okay? Because things get missed. So this is statistically uh, re recent of what traditional lab ranges are for TSH. But there's something called functional or optimal lab ranges, and these wiggle around not, not much. They don't move much. They're based off where the healthiest population is, and that's about 1.8 to 3.0. It's a tighter range, functional or optimal ranges. But if people are under 1.8, they'll always have a hyperthyroid symptom, but they don't get any recognition till they're, you know, till they're under 0.3, but way over here, they'll have symptoms every day and their doctor says it's okay. And on the other side of it, if they're over 3.0, they probably already have symptoms of hypothyroid, but there's no recognition for it until they go way over 5, 5.7, depending on on, 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 the, on the lab ranges. So this is something to be careful of because a lot of people, it's just the way their data is measured is not accurate. Uh, if you see this dog behind me, that's my sidekick here. He's uh, trying to help me here tonight. Um, so that is something to pay attention to. Um, so conventional lab tests, so these, were the, these are the types of lab tests that are traditionally done and then, and then uh, and then how to find the answers. So traditionally, and this is even Mayo Clinic, uh, they'll do TSH and sometimes T3 and T4, sometimes. But this is a full thyroid panel. And anybody with any thyroid concerns, we run all of this on everybody, on pretty well everybody. TSH, T4, T free T4, free thyroxine index, T3, free T3, T3 uptake, TG antibodies, thyroglobulin, Antibodies. This is an indicator of Hashimoto's. I'll get more into this. TPO antibodies. This, if you have this one, this is also an indicator of Hashimoto's. Reverse T3, TSH antibodies, also known as TSI. That would determine Graves' disease, which is another autoimmune condition that leads to hyperthyroid. Hashimoto's leads to hypothyroid. Uh, Graves leads to hyperthyroid. They're both autoimmune disorders, but do opposite things. Um, and TBG, this uh, taxi cab analogy, I don't Think I'll have time to talk about today. Um, so these are the are the are the ways to determine um, Hashimoto's. You have to test these, and if they're above above laboratory range, that is a diagnosis. Okay, that's how you diagnose it. And this panel, I never ever see it. I have to order it, or some other natural doctors' labs will order it when they bring them in. Okay, if you don't have all the pieces, you don't know the story. 
So again, if you have high TPO antibodies or high thyroglobulin antibodies, you could have Hashimoto. You'll have it's a diagnosis. It's not you could you do have Hashimoto's. I have the high TPO antibodies, um, but if you have either one of these highs, that's a diagnosis. Now you can have Hashimoto's and not have hypothyroidism. That's me. I have high antibodies, but my TSH is still within range, and my T3 and T4 numbers are still within range. So. Um, I'm, I'm at that stage and I'm going to talk about the stages of Hashimoto's coming up. Okay. So diagnose, so that's diagnosing Hashimoto's, but diagnosing, uh, hypothyroidism when TSH is above laboratory range, as we mentioned, um, regardless of the T3s and T4s, thyroid hormone numbers, if it's all about TSH. Okay. So again, high TSH, it's hypothyroidism. So that's how to diagnose. So TSH is simple, right? You know, the, the, everybody orders a TSH. It's no big deal. And if it's high, you're called hypo. If it's low, you're called hyper. But no one asks, very seldom does, this, does the conventional model ask, why would you be hypothyroidism? And that's where you got to start exploring Hashimoto's. I caught mine early just because I screened myself. And, you know, I do regular checkups. So that's, I'm very fortunate. Uh, and many of the clients that we work with, we caught early. And uh, we, we were able to, and that, that's a big change. So the stages of Hashimoto's, which are you if you've been diagnosed or maybe you haven't been, uh, but these are the stages. So there's three stages of Hashimoto's. Um, there's stage one, uh, Hashimoto's disease, because Hashimoto's is Hashimoto's. This is where you have elevated antibodies, but you don't have any symptoms. I am in stage one, currently at the time of recording this video, okay? Um, then there's stage two, where it starts to manifest and, and the, the injury, the damage of the thyroid is, is significant enough that the thyroid can't perform enough and thyroid T3s and T4s go down and TSH go up. So this is, you have the antibodies, TSH is elevated, which is a diagnosis of hypothyroidism, and you start to have symptoms. Okay, then the third stage, this is the most severe stage. This is where you have the antibodies, TSH is elevated, uh, the brain is screaming at the thyroid through TSH, uh, and there's you know severe hypothyroidism. You have severe symptoms, and then there's also measurable tissue destruction. So you can see this on ultrasounds and things like that. Okay, so those are the three stages. Now, this is more than just a thyroid problem. It's so important to think of Hashimoto's as more than just, okay, you have Hashimoto's. Well, doesn't matter, or it's an autoimmunity. No, 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 no. You have to be on the lookout for other things. So it does two things. Naturally, uh, uh, Hashimoto's can, will create reduced thyroid function. It'll, and, and when that happens, these are the symptoms. It'll downregulate every system in the body. You increase weight, reduce detoxification, so you can't clear toxins out of your body. Hormonal imbalances will, will, be, will, will happen. Uh, overall metabolism and energy production declines. So that's low thyroid function. And it'll also reduce brain function. A lot of brain fog associated with really poor thyroid function. Uh, it'll play into reproductive disorders, inhibit immune system function. So your immune system, your, your thyroid is necessary to have immune strength. Um, and if, if it's low enough, you'll always have emotional disorders, whether it's directly from thyroid hormone um, deficiencies or you just feel like crap and, and you're, you're, you're missing out on life. Okay. Anxiety and depression are, are huge with, um, with hypothyroidism as well. But the, the other side of it is there's also autoimmune disorder. It's an autoimmune disorder. So you end up with those disorders and those characteristics, which I need to get into. You can't understand Hashimoto's if you don't understand autoimmunity. And we want to do that today. So if diagnosed, if you're diagnosed with one autoimmune disorder, this is a scary thing. If you're diagnosed with one, there's a 50 to 60% chance you'll develop another autoimmune disorder or have another autoimmune disorder. When I found out that I have thyroid peroxidase antibodies, I was, I know the, I know the mechanisms. I, I knew this. So I was on the hunt for others. The purpose, the reason why I wanted to know is because I wanted to catch things before the damage is too far done. Because if you know what's being targeted, you can slow that down. You can't erase it, but you can slow it right down and maintain function and health. You know, even after everything I've been through at school and diabetes, I'm not diabetic anymore. And I still have to walk the line, but I'm healthier now than I was 
a long, long, long time ago. So, and most people we work with, they're able to achieve that as well. So if you have one autoimmune disorder like Hashimoto's, you should be on the hunt for others. I have another. So it's something called idiopathic thrombocytopenia. Blah, that's word vomit. What does that mean? That means it's a scary one. It means my immune system is destroying my platelets. Platelets are designed to form clots. If you can't keep enough platelets in your body, you have bleeding disorders. So far, I don't, but my platelets are low and I have to keep an eye on them. Okay, the, the, the medical intervention for that is, is to try to save your life, really, because it, it can get really, really bad. So, so that is, um, and some of these autoimmune disorders are common ones, are rheumatoid arthritis, polycystic ovarian syndrome, endometriosis, fibromyalgia, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, Crohn's, celiacs, ulcerative colitis, psoriasis, eczema, lupus. These are all autoimmune disorders. And if you have one autoimmune disorder, it doesn't mean you have these, but do your due diligence and hunt them down and check it out. Very seldom people just have one that I've ever seen in clinic, again, including myself. Um, another thing that happens with autoimmune disorders is immune weakness. So if your immune system is busy fighting yourself, your thyroid or whatever tissue in your body, it leaves your body vulnerable to not defend yourself. So a lot of people have uh, weak immune systems due to autoimmunity. Okay. So, and, and it creates a lot of exhaustion because when your immune system is ramped up fighting yourself, it's like having a flu, it will take your energy from you. Okay. So that's um, why it's more than just a thyroid issue. Um, now, autoimmune disorders, here's some facts on autoimmunity. Now we're going to start jumping into autoimmunity. One out of 12 women and one out of 24 men have an autoimmune condition. I talked about that recently with estrogen. Medical education provides minimal learning about autoimmune disease. It, 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 they, it's a moving target autoimmunity. There is no drug to fix autoimmunity. The closest thing there is is a steroid to shut the immune system down. We can only be on steroids so long. Steroids are necessary for many disorders. It's it's a heaven sent to some regards. And I don't even prescribe pharmaceuticals, but oh my goodness, there is a place for them. But I have a love-hate relationship with them. I love them for acute flares for when they're needed. I hate them for the long-term if, the if no other strategies are looked at because long-term steroid use create a whole host of problems. They, they're, just, they're just not designed for long-term. It's an interesting fact. According to the Department of Health and Human Ser Services Officer, uh, Office of Women's Health, autoimmune disease, diseases and disorders ranked number one on a top 10 list of the most popular health topics requested by callers to the National Women's Health Information Center. So there's a big, big need for information on autoimmunity. And again, Hashimoto's is just an autoimmune condition, but Hashimoto's doesn't see anything about the mechanism. It's understanding autoimmunity. And a lot of people are looking for these answers. Right now, it takes an average of 20 years and 30 healthcare professionals to get diagnosed with many different autoimmune disorders. Yeah, it's that. And, and talk about doctor burnout. I do a podcast with a colleague of mine called Brainstorming with the Docs, if you've ever followed some of the content. And we have a podcast. We have one episode dedicated to, to this topic, uh, doctor burnout. Not for the doctors, but for the patients because they've been everywhere. And the reason why it's taking this long is because largely in part by insurance. Insurance has limited, uh, limited efforts for insurance to be able to do diagnostic testing. Okay. And if they don't do the testing, they don't know. Okay. So that's um, thyroid. Now, some of the causes of Hashimoto's disease, there's actually causes to autoimmunity. We always have to look for cause. Problem with autoimmunity is it's not that specific, the causes. Okay. So, so with autoimmunity, um, again, our Hashimoto's is an immune problem. It's not a thyroid problem. We established that it's, uh, an immune problem that's resulting in a thyroid problem. And there's two major causes for autoimmune disorders, any forms. And there's literally millions of autoimmune disorders that aren't even diagnosed yet. Okay. There's familial. So family can inherit it down most commonly your mother. So you can blame your mom for this, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, but if mom ha is carrying around a baby, you and she and she has an autoimmune disorder she shares that confused immune system with you and you usually don't experience the autoimmune symptom till later on in life till the tissue is damaged enough 
So we can blame a little bit of it on our, on our moms. And then the other one is a trigger, a trigger, a significant, massive trigger. It could be a physical trigger, an emotional trigger, or a chemical trigger. I think about my situation. How did I develop two autoimmunities? Well, I don't know. I didn't have these tests before I, you know, I, I, I turned into a diabetic, but um, there's probably a very good chance that that was a tipping point. That was the most, uh, every had every stress here imaginable. It was the hardest, the darkest part of my life. Um, and chances are maybe that's when, when these autoimmunities were turned on. Okay, so that's um, some of the causes. So uh, familial, again, we can blame the parents, mother, most commonly. Genetics, there's a little bit of a genetic factor, but it's not that common genetics with Hashimoto's. Again, these stressors, these triggers, these tipping points, it could be physical. Concussions cause autoimmunities. See it all the time. Every week, in fact, in my office. Physical traumas can do this. Concussions, car accidents, as I mentioned. Chemical triggers. So you can see mold and stuff like that and, and toxins in your homes, turning autoimmunity on. I've seen that. Uh, infections can also do it. <clears throat> uh, I've seen Lyme's disease and Epstein-Barr turn these disorders on and COVID. We're just learning about this and how bad COVID is going to turn autoimmunity on. There's something, if you're watching this, you maybe have heard of long hauler syndrome or long hauler syndrome, something like that. That is a big, big player that they can't figure out quite, you know, we're blaming it on COVID. Yeah. But is COVID that virus turning on multiple autoimmune disorders because long hauler syndrome is associated with multiple organ system symptoms, cardiovascular symptoms and, and blood sugar symptoms and skin symptoms and, and, and musculoskeletal symptoms. So when it's all over systemic, we've got to think autoimmunity. So we don't know enough about this yet speculation right now, but that's a massive trigger COVID on the body and the immune system it could be confusing it. And then you start targeting yourself. So emotional, uh, of course, relationships are powerful. I've seen, I've seen divorces and bankruptcies turn autoimmunities on like Parkinson's disease and multiple sclerosis. I've seen it. So take care of your emotions. Health is not just blood chemistry or any of that. And traumas, childhood traumas as well can build up and cause problems in the future. So there's some causes of Hashimoto's. I know I'm running through this quickly, guys. Um, I have honestly never went through this presentation till right now. So I, I know I have to try to respect everybody's time. And uh, yeah, I'll try to get this online in the next few weeks if I have time. So understanding autoimmune disease and Hashimoto's thyroiditis, um, it's important to understand autoimmunity. Okay, this is where everything is. Don't accept it's just a, hash, a, a thyroid problem. Find out why. Hmm. So autoimmune disorders, again, cannot be cured. And I feel I have to keep saying this. It must be managed. Uh, effective management is complicated. It's very complex. It's the reason why our clinic, everything we do is comprehensive. Even our paperwork is, I think it's like 24 pages now. Because everything has to be. Because if you're going to learn why, how autoimmunity is very complicated. Okay. And it's actually the vast majority of our clients now is autoimmunity. Um, there's very unique symptoms with autoimmunity. Uh, it's like a roller coaster of symptoms. Uh, the characteristics of autoimmunity is there's flares and symptoms. Some days are good. Some days are bad. Some days are a little bit better. Some days are worse. It's this up and down roller coaster of symptoms. And sometimes people, a lot of times people can't put their finger on it. Why they have these flares with flare episodes and symptoms are a characteristic of autoimmunity. They're, so they're notable. There's also energy drops with these flares, significant energy drops. And that's where the, the immune system throttles up, attacking your tissue, and your immune system is stealing your energy by fighting you. It turns in this vicious, terrible cycle, okay? Because if your energy goes down, then you can't heal yourself, right? So the, the cycle has to stop and, and so energy draws, multiple symptoms of different body systems. What does this mean? Well, here's an example. Somebody has flares and digestive problems, but every time their digestive sy symptoms flare, whatever symptom that is, digestive symptom, they end up with simp flares and joint pain. Two different systems, body uh, systems, but they have multiple symptoms. Yeah, I remember this lady I worked with, she said, you know, Dr. Harrison, I don't get it. Every time my stomach bothers me, it seems like my rheumatoid arthritis gets worse. I'm like, yep, that's exactly what's going on. 
So, um, so that's what I mean by multiple symptoms have of different body systems. And then what happens if you go to the conventional medicine? I'm going to pick on them too, but I hopefully have time to pick on natural medicine too. Um, if you go in and you have a stomach problem, and every time you have a stomach problem, you have a you have a joint problem. So you go there for your stomach, and they give you something for your stomach, and then you go there for your joint, and they give you something for your joint. But there's a connection. That's why autoimmunity it can't be man it can't be managed with conventional medicine. It's just not designed for that. It's just not designed. Um, anything that aggravates your immune system is an autoimmune trigger. This is very important. This is how you manage autoimmunity. You identify triggers, any trigger, and we'll get into that. But that's a very, very important point to know. And, and, and these triggers could be chemical, physical, emotional, and then there's something else. I didn't know if I'd have time to put it into this presentation, but I did. So uh, something called molecular mimicry. Maybe some of you have heard of it. Maybe you haven't, but I'm going to explain it today. So that takes us to molecular mimicry. So molecular mimicry, there is mimicry in nature. I thought this was kind of a neat picture that I found um, where one is trying to be like the other. I don't think the owl is trying to be like the, I think it's a butterfly. It looks like a butterfly, but, but yeah, it's just similarities naturally. So molecular mimicry with regards to autoimmunity, it is, Molecular mimicry is when your immune system cannot identify the difference between two similar looking structures. Hmm. It might get, it might not know the difference between your thyroid and another tissue in your body or your thyroid and a food or your thyroid and a chemical or your thyroid and an infection, a, a parasite, a, a pathogen. So the, the immune system recognizes something as good or bad by its shape. It's three dimensional structure. And um, if the shape isn't right, the immune system doesn't like it. If one shape, like say that owl and the butterfly look the same to your immune system, your immune system will treat them the same. Okay. So it creates immune confusion. And this confusion can exist between your tissues, your chemicals, foods, and your immune system can potentially cross react to one another. So if two tissues or, or your tissue and a food look the same, for example, if your immune system is reacting to your thyroid, doesn't like your thyroid, it's not going to forget, it's damaging it. And then you introduce something in the body that looks like your thyroid, the same shape, what happens? Your immune system gets flared up because now your immune system has more targets. It, it flares up your Hashimoto's. If you introduce something in your body that looks like your thyroid, hopefully it, it's it makes sense. So your, your immune system can start cross-reacting with your thyroid and this other thing entering your body. So cross-reactivity is widely studied. It's not a myth. Maybe 15 years ago, 20 years ago it was. Now it's, now it's, it's, it's everywhere. It, it is the, it's big. Here's an example. The thyroid tissue and gluten protein. So gluten is found in gluten-containing grains. Um, thyroid tissue has a similar shape. That's what my little diagram here is supposed to look like thyroid tissue has a similar shape to to the shape of gluten. If you have autoimmunity to your thyroid, what happens if you introduce a bunch of gluten in your diet, you're going to flare up your Hashimoto's or have a very good chance. Let's put it that way. You could have a very good chance. You're going to flare up your Hashimoto's because you're introducing more targets in your body that your immune system has to fight. If your immune system thinks your thyroid's a tumor, what happens if you introduce a whole bunch more thyroids in your body. Well, then your immune system has to fight everything, flaring up your existing Hashimoto's because you don't want, when you have your immune systems targeting yourself, you need to get your immune system calm and cool and collective. You don't want to give it more work. That's why you have to pull out these triggers. So gluten is a closely, re, it, it closely resembles by its shape to thyroid. If you got Hashimoto's like me, and maybe you, if you're watching, you don't want to be consuming gluten. But if you want to consume gluten and you, and you don't know if you have a problem, get it tested, get it tested. So cross-reactivity can occur between dietary proteins and human tissue proteins due to molecular mimicry. I'm going to extend this. Cross-reactivity can occur between dietary proteins, human tissue proteins, like your thyroid, pathogens, and chemicals. And we'll get into this. So molecular mimicry and cross-reactivity, hopefully I was able to nail this down for you. It is real. It is very, very real. And we have to be careful what looks like the tissue that our body is targeting. Okay. So thyroid tissue cross-reactants. 
There's lots. Gluten is a cross-reacting, all in the research and the journals, dairy, soy, and legumes. Chemicals, BPA. Don't be drinking water out of plastic. Don't do it. You build a BPA uh, in your body and, and naturally what'll happen is you can react and flare up your Hashimoto's. Specific, this is specific to thyroid tissue, pesticides, air pollutions, fire retardants, and then pathogens. This is big. Uh, H. pylori, uh, this is a, uh, if you probably heard of it, is a bacterial infection of the gut. Um, and um, it's the most common bacterial infection in the world. Okay. So also don't let your dogs lick your face <laughs> because they have lots of H. pylori all over their mouth. And uh, if we don't have a good enough digestive tract, we can end up getting infected. So there's lots of different uh, pathogens. Now I could put other cross-reactive tissues here that are other bodily tissues that look like thyroid tissue. There's one major one, and I'm not gonna get into others, but there's one major one, and that's your cerebellum, your brain tissue. So if people have enough, if Hashimoto is bad enough, and then they start having more and more balance disorders, their immune system is targeting their thyroid, but their thyroid tissue looks a lot like their cerebellum. So their immune system starts targeting their thyroid cerebellum. Is very, very dangerous. So there's something, something called gluten ataxia. It's actually a diagnosis. So uh, cross-reactive, hopefully we were able to nail this down. And all of these, when we get nervous, we're like, oh my goodness, what if I have all these infections and uh, I've got chemicals in my body and I eat these? And like, well, we live in a bubble or we can test. We can actually test cross-reactants. We test all the time in our office, knowing rather than guessing. But if we're gonna guess, these are highly cross-reactive with thyroid. But if you test and you're clear in these, well, then you don't need to worry about them. Mm -hmm. So that is cross-reactivity and molecular mimicry. So um, now managing the layers of autoimmunity. This is where the magic happens. And I wish I could just give you a silver bullet and you could finish watching this webinar. And you're like, yeah, I've got it. I've got it. I know what I got to do. No, it's unfortunately, it's not as, um, it's not as simple as that. But I'll give you some tools. Remember, managing autoimmunity is complicated. Okay. So there's different layers. And part of these layers were introduced by a colleague of mine. So I can't take full, uh, full uh, credit for introducing these layers. Lots of layers. So we'll take a look at this. When I'm working with people, I'm, I'm referencing this as the layers of my clinical experience. Who does the best? And we see some absolutely crazy things. We see every form of autoimmunity that I've ever that I've ever heard of amongst my colleagues, okay? We have people flying in for their appointments now because they'll read or hear something that we talked about and it'll make sense to them. And they'll say, whoa, that wasn't looked at. So they'll come in. So the, a major part of autoimmunity is people have to know what the heck's going on. Education is necessary. You have to understand the roller coaster of autoimmunity. You have to know when you're in a relapse and when you're in remission. And then what to do when you're in a relapse and what to do when you're in a remission of your symptoms and knowing how to identify that. You have to know the stages. We talked about stages. You have to know about foods. You have to know about chemicals. You have to know about pathogens and you have to know the effects of stress. Some people stress affects their autoimmunity. Some people not as much, but it affects everybody. Lifestyle management is very, very important. Relationships, stress, sleep, exercise. If you have any sleep deprivation or anything that's causing a sleep problem, you flare up your autoimmunity. It doesn't matter what's going on. You have to promote a physical activity because it produces chemicals to calm your immune system. Right? Dietary management. Now, remember, this slide is about autoimmunity. It's not just about thyroid. You can't talk about thyroid health unless you talk about autoimmunity. You can't talk about Hashimoto's if you're not understanding autoimmunity. That's why I'm doing this uh, for you guys. So gluten, dairy, nightshades are not cross-reactant, but they're an immune irritant. You can test these, right? Again, live in a bubble or test. Testing is going to be the most uh, accurate and going to create the most compliance for making lifestyle changes. Lactin salt. Sodium tends to be a bit of an immune, uh, an autoimmune irritant, not specifically for, for um, Hashimoto's, but overall autoimmune irritant. And then I talked about molecular mimicry. So now you know what that is. Antigen management. These are like pathogens, viruses, bacteria. You should know if there's a, a Lyme issue, know if there's a mold issue. I have a lot of people that turn on severe autoimmunity to mold. In fact, I'm going to be doing a, a toxic presentation with two other colleagues, and we're going to have uh, a client that I worked with, and we're going to talk about her journey through her mold 
and her autoimmunity and how everything got turned on and how she's coming out of it. Really remarkable story. That'll be coming out in a couple of weeks. So you can go on our website and you can uh, learn about when it's happening then. Parasites are hard to find, but they should be ruled out. And again, molecular mimicry, you can have, these can mimic other tissues in the body. So they can, this can aggravate through molecular mimicry. Chemical management, we talked a little bit about these in heavy metals and, and chemicals can cross react like BPA cross reacts with your thyroid. Immune barrier. This is where we get into leaky gut. If you've ever heard of leaky gut, I don't have time to talk about it today, but intestinal permeability, it's where there's uh, perforations in your intestinal uh, barrier and, and food proteins and toxins cross out of your gut into your bloodstream, creating an immune response. Remember, it's like poking your security guard, your immune system. You irritate that immune system, it's going to irritate, it's going to damage its existing target tissue more. So the goal is, again, uh, um, uh, coddling your immune system so it has no reason to react and knowing with the science and we have the science. So making sure there's no intestinal uh, barrier, leaky gut. There's also something called leaky brain. I've done videos on leaky brain. It's a real thing. Blood brain barrier permeability. There's also leaky gut, a leaky lung. We're learning about this. So people who have chronic respiratory infections, we're able to see pathogens toxins from their from the airways getting into the bloodstream through their lungs, creating an immune irritation, like asthma, aggravating asthma. Yeah, asthma is an autoimmunity as well. Um, immune tolerance. Um, so there's immune barriers. If you have any of these barriers breached, you're constantly introducing toxins into your bloodstream and, and these toxins are, are, are irritants to your immune system, flaring your autoimmunity. Immune tolerance, distinguish and downregulate and diversify. This is my colleagues as well. So diversifying is having increased plant diversity. This is down the road. You got to clean up all of this stuff and make sure this is all corrected before you can get into immune tolerance. So I can't elaborate too much on immune tolerance right now. This is just layer one. This is the big layer. Okay. Then there's a second layer. I think my dog's getting frustrated here. So then there's the second layer, uh, managing autoimmune flare-ups. Remember the roller coaster. You can get, feel a little bit better and then you get a flare in symptoms and you feel a little bit better. People have to know what to do when they have a flare because you're going to still have episodes of flares, but the flare should be farther apart and not nearly as severe. And it's drastic. That's from getting someone that is bedridden, always in a flare, to being able to uh, pursue school and, and maintain a career at the same time and be able to exercise and live their life and all of that. I've seen that a million times. So layer two is once you get people uh, somewhat stabilized and once, once someone's stabilized, then they have to be able to understand their, their autoimmune flares and what to do. Okay. Understanding triggers and where they are. Third layer it's down at the bottom. I put it in red Pharma pharmacology management, pharmaceutical management. Um, drugs are necessary. I really do believe they are in, in many cases. Um, uh, so I'm not anti-drug, I'm anti-drug everything. And autoimmunity, my goodness, has a place for drugs. <laughs> it really does. Um, it does. It's not a fix. It's kind of helping people get out of flares. And sometimes people need a little bit of a pharmacology and a whole bunch of lifestyle. Um, a whole bunch of pharmacology and a little bit of lifestyle is really not a formula for health. It's, um, it's, it, it needs to be the other way. And thyroid issues. If someone is hypothyroid, well, the severe hypothyroid, all the natural strategies in the world are going to have a slow effect. I've seen it in my clinic and we've had good outcomes, but uh, in, with very se serious hypothyroidism that people don't want to pursue medications, but I want them to at least a temporary because if thyroid hormones are too low, every system in the body slows down. They can't even recover. So low thyroid function is an immune irritant. So sometimes some pharmacology at the start to get things up, and then we get the body running better. And then, and then we can have conversations with the prescribing physician about, you know, the numbers are better. Can we reevaluate medication? So pharmacology is part of the story too. Okay. So that's huh, a lot of layers, if you will, but it's important to know. It's not as simple as just take a vitamin here and here you go. You know, green pharmacology is not a solution either. And people go on entire lives suffering, missing out on their lives being told that this will work or this pill will work or that pill will work, whether it's a supplement or a vitamin or a, or a medication, it's not that simple. The cases have to be worked through and autoimmunity and autoimmune management cookie cutter approaches never work. 
because everybody's immune triggers are a little bit different. I talk about some common foods that are cross reactants, but everybody immune triggers are different. Okay. And that, that's a very important thing to know. So here's the medical strategy for hypothyroidism. Let's just take a quick look back. Here is the layers of overall autoimmune management. And here is medical management for hypothyroidism, regardless of the cause of hypothyroidism. You have overt thyroid symptoms. So this is obvious thyroid symptoms. And then, then, then you get a TSH test. They'll give you TSH. And then after, when TSH, then TH, TSH is, is high, then it's a diagnosis of hypothyroidism. Then they give you T4 because T4 is, is kind of the, the most common medication. You still need to convert that T4, remember, the liver and the gut. And then once you have T4, then they retest usually about annually. annually. It depends on the insurance, what they're going to cover. But TSH can actually change within a few days. So if your medications are too high, <laughs> what happens a year down the road? You, you know, you could have had a problem for an entire year. So when we're working with thyroid issues and people are on thyroid medications, we will be, re a lot of times we'll retest every month, depending on where they are in their, in their clinical journey. Um, so this is the story though. It's limited to say the least. So that's um, <clears throat> managing the layers of autoimmunity. <laughs> now, now, a lot of times people will pursue my content. They'll be like, okay, what's the magic vitamin? Mm, there is none, but I will give some strategies, what we find in the research and I see clinically that um, can be helpful. There's no silver bullet. Remember, there's no silver bullet. So I'm going to break it up a little bit into two different categories. There's autoimmune uh, nutritional supplementation. We've got to be careful with this stuff. And there's some brand new information I'm going to throw at you guys. Brand new. Well, it's just recent, recently published, and there's been enough journals to support it that now it's got recognition. Iodine. What is the story with iodine and thyroid? Well, at one time, iodine, years and years ago, we were we, humans became iodine deficient living off the coast, living away from the coast. So then, then iodine was added to salt, iodized salt, and it got rid of everybody's enlarged thyroids, or their goiters great. And years went on and now we have this same type of salt and every preservative and every food. It, it's it, in North America, it's hard to hide from iodine. You couldn't hide from it. It's everywhere. Okay. It's absolutely everywhere. Now we're seeing problems with too high of iodine that are not only, not only supplement iodine is, can create too, too much iodine, but actually um, dietary iodine can be too much. So many, many studies are showing that uh, populations with iodine deficient diets, deficient iodine diets, they still have iodine coming in, right? And the, uh, the thyroid stores a bunch of iodine actually, but even, but in populations with iodine deficient diets, they had lots of, they had lots of amazing outcomes. Um, and there's many studies supporting this now, and I could reference all of them, but I don't have time today. I'll be making a YouTube video on this topic. Subscribe to the channel. I'll give you the link after. There's over 150 videos on this channel, probably 170 now since the last time I counted. But I will do one on iodine exclusively if you have to debate your neighbor on iodine and, and, and thyroid health. But what we're seeing is the requirements are needed less than 120 micrograms, not milligrams, micrograms per day. That's like the, the salt on the, the quantity of table salt of the head of a pin. We don't need any. Okay. We don't need any. I used to, you know, not long ago, I was supplementing or I was giving some of my patients supplementing with iodine. And because I would see labs showing low, well, I guess we learn, right? Now we're like, no, no, there's no iodine even in my office now. Okay. No supplements even with iodine, no thyroid supplements, nothing with iodine. It's not allowed. <laughs> if we see symptoms, well, then we'll test. But the research shows the, the, the case is closed on this. So, um, I recommend you still want to salt your food. Don't use any kind of salt with iodine. Himalayan salt is one of the great ones, but there's others out there. Just make sure there's no iodine. Okay. If you have any thyroid issue and want to avoid a thyroid issue, iodine restricted diets have shown significant improvements in uh, reducing Hashimoto's progression. Really, really interesting stuff. Reducing uh, TSH elevations, uh, reducing TPO antibody and, T and thyroglobulin antibody elevations reducing the onset of hyperthyroidism. So high iodine was making thyroids do all sorts of things. So what we're learning is iodine in our body has to be just in a very tight little window. And our modern day iodine saturated environments, it's hard to avoid and it's creating problems. 
So, um, so that's iodine. Stay away from it. Now, targeted supplementation. Um, do not take products that have too many ingredients with regards to autoimmune nutritional supplementations. Many ingredients can, can cause problems and it can flare your autoimmunity up. Foods, chemicals, pathogens, et cetera. We have to worry about those with autoimmunity, but don't underestimate supplementation. And not all supplements are effective and not all supplementation is safe. I've done a podcast on brainstorming with the docs with my colleague, Dr. Colby. And we were discussing how to find effective supplements, safe supplements. Supplements aren't regulated. So, you know, you really got to be careful with them. Okay. We're not too worried about not having the content in the supplement. We're worried about bacteria and mildew and, and all of these different things, um, toxins, mycotoxins, because of poor thermal regulation. So now um, targeted nutritional supplementation for Hashimoto's and autoimmunity. So autoimmune supplementation. All right. So anything from a supplement standpoint, it should have a purpose. Now, if someone has, a, I don't know, uh, ulcerative colitis, this autoimmunity of the digestive tract. Well, chances are some targeted supplementation for the digestive tract to try to speed up healing. But this is specifically for the immune system and calming the immune system down. And then I'll talk about some specific uh, Hashimoto supplementation because there's some overlap and there's some differences. So glutathione, I've done videos on glutathione. It's the most powerful antioxidant we know of and we make it. The problem is with autoimmunity, we have too many immune fires going on, like Hashimoto's, et cetera. And we run out of this fire extinguisher. Glutathione is huge. Please, please, please don't use L-glutathione. There's something called S-acetyl L-glutathione and L-glutathione. You want the S-acetyl. L-glutathione, 90% of it burns up in your stomach acid before it ever gets in your bloodstream. So if you eat 100 capsules of L-glutathione, 10 might make it into your bloodstream. It's not worth the money. Get S-acetyl L-glutathione. Reach out to us if you have questions. You can even order these things from us. We can give you all the information on that. I've done videos on it. Uh, vitamin D. Vitamin D is an immune modulator. Uh, turmeric. <clears throat> curcumin is found in turmeric. Um, this is very, very powerful as an immune calming agent. Millions of studies on turmeric. Resveratrol is another powerful antioxidant. Omegas, don't just take um, a little bit of omegas. Uh, our DNA requires, the research shows three to four grams a day. That's a lot of omegas, but it's, a, it's, a, it's the original anti-inflammatory. We're supposed to be, and, and not just vegan sources. They're not as good. If, you, if you're able to eat nor, you know, food that isn't, that isn't vegan uh, you know, certified, um, make sure you, you, you use uh, normal omegas. They, they pack way more of a punch than, than algae omegas um, or plant-based omegas. <clears throat> so uh, specific for Hashimoto's, you can see glutathione is, 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 the, is, a big, is a big player in this. Selenium. Selenium is very, very good for Hashimoto's. Um, my, my own is all my own is all that one is powerful as well. We have, we have, we have cocktails of these that have both of these in them now in the office for Hashimoto's only for Hashimoto's patients, myself as well, vitamin D and curcumin. There's more research on just curcumin. Remember curcumin is, is found in turmeric, but there's more research on curcumin for Hashimoto's, um, than, than overall turmeric. If you take turmeric, tur turmeric, you'll get some curcumin in it as well. So for autoimmunity, Turmeric will be a better, a better bet. So that is targeted. Now this is targeted. Remember, not taking something just to take it. This is to help downregulate your immune responses. That's what it's for. Okay. You don't take it in your, you know, you're like, oh, I feel great. You take it over time with lifestyle implementations and you will see your numbers improve and hopefully stabilize. Okay. And resveratrol. I missed that one. So that is some targeted nutritional supplementation. So now we're coming just a barely just over the hour. Um, probably feel overwhelmed. <laughs> well, if, if you weren't feeling overwhelmed, that would mean I didn't do my job in explaining these things. Oversimplification of chronic illness, including autoimmunity, is the biggest mistake in medicine, both sides of the aisle, natural medicine and pharmaceutical medicine. Okay. Oversimplification. Someone says they have Hashimoto's, you're going to reverse it with a vitamin they're crazy. Run the other way. If someone, if, if, if you tell someone they have, you have Hashimoto's and you want to work on your thyroid and, and no one's talking about autoimmunity, 
run the other way. If some, if you have Hashimoto's and you're talking to someone, a doctor or any kind of provider and, and they say, it really doesn't matter, run the other way. It's much more complicated than that. Um, so if you feel overwhelmed, there's a lot of content on our website. Again, uh, information doesn't heal people. It just gives them a little bit of guidance. Uh, information doesn't give them you know, the laboratory testing and the unique, unique uh, uh, approach that, that they require. But there is information on our website, and I put it up there for this exact reason. But if you need more help and you're looking for my answers, you can always reach out to us. Um, we're, uh, you know, there's a, we still have a discounted consultation for people watching our, our, our content um, like this. And I believe right now it's, um, I think it's like half. It's a full hour, our consultation. It's not just a chat. It's a deep Ooh, 24 pages of paperwork that you'll get in advance. At the time of this video, it's 24. And in the future, it might go up. It's very thorough. Everything is thorough in our office. That's the only way our clients can get the outcomes they do. And it takes work. But, um, but the, the consultation is um, it's a, more of a case review. We're going to look at everything. We're going to look at all your past lab history. Um, and we're going to sit down for an hour together and, and go through everything um, to help you figure it out. Um, actually get an understanding of your case. We're not going to be starting treatment that day or care that day, but you're going to know, you're going to have my clinical interpretation based off all the findings that you have at that point. Sometimes at the end of that appointment, or a lot of times at the end of that appointment, we have to dig deeper with labs. So at the end of that appointment, I can give an, under, an explanation of what kind of lab tests that would be required and, and you know, what my thought process and, and make sure you're in the right place. You know, we might not be the clinic for you. So we don't take everybody. Um, but if someone is willing and ready and ready to look at both sides of the aisle, the medical and the non-medical, uh, non-pharmaceutical efforts and, and is motivated, we're, we're probably the right fit. But, um, but it's more of a two-way interview to make sure that we want to work with each other. It's because it has to be a relationship. So that's, um, <clears throat> that's presentation, but there's a big discount on this. Just give us a call. Uh, that's our contact information. Pursue our website. There's a lot of content on there. Um, I know this discount is going to change come the new year. Rates have to go up and everything. Everything has to go up a little bit. So um, definitely reach out to us. And uh, I believe we have opportunity or, or a room on the schedule, I think a week, probably a week, something like that, a week and a half. Um, so anyhow, I know there was lots here, but I hope it was helpful. Um, coming, you know, coming from me, I have this disorder. I caught it in stage one. Um, and, and I'm healthier with autoimmunity than I was without it because I changed my life. So you can do that as well. So anyhow, um, I look forward to talking to you next day, next month, we're going to have another topic. Um, keep, keep track of our page and, uh, and we'll notify you when it's coming. So thanks for joining me and I look forward to talking to you soon.